Welcome back to the 2020 Gilder Fellows. Uh, we have are joined actually by longtime friend Matt Schultz, who was actually a colleague at the Discovery Institute for many years. Uh, Matt is a serial entrepreneur here in the Seattle area. He's currently the chief executive officer and co-founder of Oisin Bio. Uh, he's also the founder and CEO of Immu. <laughs> Immusoft. <laughs> I, know, I know I was going to mess that up. Immu, I've only said it a thousand times. It's a biotech firm actually developing a breakthrough technology uh, that turns a patient's B cells into miniature and drug factories. So uh, this has to do with immunology. It's obviously a big topic that people are suddenly interested in with COVID-19, obviously. I'm going to be talking about COVID-19 actually later in the morning if you really want to know. We haven't asked Matt to do that. Uh, Matt is a popular speaker, is a graduate of the University of Washington, uh, and is going to apply some of these information ideas actually to the biosphere and in particular to the human immune system. So as usual, Matt will talk for a little while. He's going to actually share some slides and then we'll come back on and take some questions at the end. So Matt, back to you. So yes, um, I have a, I've made kind of an interesting journey and uh, and I think it, it always helps when you're starting something uh, new like this to have a, a North Star of sorts that, that guides you in it. And mine was that the essence of life is information and that chemistry is effectively a, a substrate and it, it's a valuable one. Um, and throughout the history of medicine, you know, we've seen benefits from it, but, uh, but it really is, uh, you know, it's like trying to debug Microsoft Word by changing the microchips in your computer. It's not the, the essence of what makes life life and tampering with it often it leads to unintended consequences. And I think to, to set the context for what we're doing now, it's worth considering of kind of where we've come from in medicine, from like the, the earliest days of, of recorded history, say like medicine consisted of, of plants and prayers. And we have records going back on this uh, several thousand years at least, um, but basically for most of human history, uh, medicine consisted of, of smashed up plants, uh, small molecule drugs uh, that weren't at the time characterized, but that's where they came from. And you know, you fast forward uh, quite a bit, but maybe not quite as far forward as one might think. We started using biologics, uh, drugs that basically came from from other living uh, things. And I guess the first one uh, would that's really documented is uh, the cowpox vaccine, where they would basically take you know, the blister from a cowpox uh, blister and smear it on a person as a vaccination for smallpox. And uh, this, you know, th basic things like blood serum, things that we didn't really know what they were per se, they weren't well ca characterized, but they are coming from, you know, complex living life. And uh, the uh, going forward from there, we got into things like recombinant biologics, where we began to make these kinds of proteins in a dish uh, and characterize them better. And actually it's kind of an interesting uh, history Think back that the very first tissue transplant done was done in like the 1600s and it's pretty odd to think about that like that uh, people were doing tissue transplants before they had antibiotics before they had uh, like lidocaine type painkillers anesthetics or, or ethers they were removing <laughs> tissue in it uh, or electricity for that matter to, to light the whole setup so uh we've been at this for a bit but uh more recently, we started turning life itself into drugs, things like cell therapies, you know, the first bone marrow transplants, and then things like CAR T cells um, uh, coming after that, where instead of just taking a cell and using it as a drug, we modify it. And so this is kind of the, the trajectory we followed. And if you were to plot this all on a timeline, it's very compressed uh, into recent history. And so the first thing I did as I got into bio was try to build an app store for the human body. And so if you think about the thesis that the essence of life is information, well, why don't you change the code? I mean, after all, like uh, your body can turn a cup of coffee into flesh and blood, um, all with its genetic instructions. If you can manipulate that code, you can build anything. And so Immusoft's first uh, mission, if you will, is to build an app store for the human body. And so instead of making a drug and injecting it, we would take the patient cells out, change their DNA and put them back, and they would make treatments inside of you. And this allows you to do things that really aren't possible other ways. And this is an example I like to show because it, it's both entertaining, but also it, it really does <laughs> illustrate what you can do if you mess with the code of life. So this, uh, the cow there on the left is, uh, it's called a Belgian blue cow. So it's deficient in something called myostatin, a negative regular regulator of skeletal muscle growth. And uh, it, it's about twice the muscle mass of a normal cow. And there's actually humans who have this mutation uh, that have been documented and you'll see like children that are super ripped. Um, but uh, 
these uh, mice on the, the right kind of illustrate what you can do when you start tinkering with this pathway. So the, the left column is a normal mouse. The middle column is like the Belgian blue cow. It lacks that uh, uh, re negative regulator. The one on the right, though, uh, has overexpressed. It's producing a, a molecule called follistatin. And that makes it twice the size of the middle one. So it's four times normal muscle mass of a, of a mouse. And it's, it's enormous. And, uh, and so basically, this is the biochemical pathway for exercise or skeletal muscle exercise. And like the joke about, you know, being the, the lazy scientist I am, I thought, well, what if you just turn that on 24 seven in a person, you know, you, you get big without having to work out. And, uh, and as entertaining as it is in a uh, monkeying with the anti doping committee might be fun. Um, but uh, this has, I think, real use for uh, diseases of age and notably muscle wasting, you know, physical strength counts for a lot. If you can make an old person strong, uh, be the difference between needing a walker or not, or a wheelchair versus a walker. And the, the interesting thing about that, though, is the molecule falstatin has a really short half-life. So if you wanted to try to make it like a drug and inject it, you'd be injecting it all the time, effectively. Um, so being able to manipulate your own source code, if you will, to produce it all the time can make it viable where traditional means would not be. Okay, so these days I've begun focusing on aging uh, with this company, Oshin uh, Biotechnologies. And what we've... Uh, it really got us into this was, you know, this kind of, I guess, basic fact that is often ignored, but that aging is the master corollary for pretty much any malady you could think of. I mean, you have worse odds of having cancer as a clean living 70 year old than you do a chain smoking 20 year old. And that's not to say that, you know, your ill spent youth won't haunt you later. But the, the accumulation of damage over time, the aging itself, is actually a bigger risk factor than most anything you can consider. And something you know, near and dear to our heart, if you were to take, uh, this is the mortality for uh, COVID-19 uh, pulled from the US CDC just a couple days ago. And you can see it, it fits on that exact line. 97.3 of those deaths from COVID-19 are occurring in people who are over 45. And the, the farther that age goes up, the more it compresses. Like the, uh, if you move it up uh, 10 more years, it's like 99%. And so this is something that is, you know, I guess obvious if you think about it, it, it effectively follows the, the rough distribution of all cause mortality. It's not really unique. It's not an equal opportunity killer at all. Like it largely spares the young and it slaughters the old. Um, it's a, a, a friend of mine started calling these diseases a uh, gerolabic, like basically, destructive or punishing to the old. And, uh, and, and indeed, a lot of diseases are like this. And so we want to go after aging itself, like what, what drives that phenomenon? And there's lots of drivers of aging, but uh, we settled as a first target on something called senescence. And a senescent cell, it can kind of be thought of like a, a zombie cell. It's uh, basically been damaged in such a way that it can either fix itself and enter normal cell function or kill itself. So it's just stuck there. And uh, when they get stuck there, they secrete all sorts of inflammatory molecules, uh, cytokines in particular, that both poison nearby stem cells and contribute to like broad inflammation across the body. And uh, so there's actually, the, I, I don't know who's, who all seen this. These uh, mice are from a fairly famous study a few years back. And I refer to them sometimes as the, the mice that launched a thousand ships. So uh, in, in this case, these mice were genetically modified so that you could get rid of those damaged cells um, with, with a simple drug. And so those two mice there are litter mates. They're the same age, the same genetic, same diet, same lifestyle. But one of them looks pretty bad and the other looks pretty good. And uh, in fact, if you start removing these damaged cells from a young age, most of the pathologies of age never manifest themselves at all. They remain basically youthful until they die. And they also live longer too. But uh, so the, the goal in most of the work we focus on isn't so much improving your lifespan, it's improving your health span. Like, <clears throat> no one wants to be 200 if it means living like a hundred year old for just another hundred years. Um, and so the, the goal is to improve health span and, uh, and improving lifespan is kind of a side effect. <clears throat> Unfortunately, in the you know, grand tradition, I guess, of academic studies, this is pretty useless from a translational perspective. I mean, to implement it, that you'd have to go back in time and modify your own embryo. And ethics aside, it's not practical. 
Um, so we set out to build a tool that would get rid of those damaged cells in a way that's clinically viable. And I suppose uh, if, if one wants to get rid of cells, it's also worth considering how, how we've done that over time. And uh, starting back from things that were really pretty indiscriminate, like knives or radiation, um, they just kill anything they touch. So if you get a sharper knife, it's better. A more focused beam, it's better. Uh, to things like you know, chemotherapies and small molecule drugs, uh, basically metabolic poisons that are kind of carpet bomb the body. Anyone who's ever taken these or known to us can attest to how destructive they can be. But today, the, the state of the art for getting rid of unwanted cells are really things like monoclonal antibodies and CAR T cells. And we refer to these things commonly as targeted medicines. But uh, it's worth considering for a moment that they just kill the surface, uh, kill cells based on their surface proteins. So uh, a, a CAR T cell kills any B cell, not just a cancerous one. And I've, I've kind of referred to it jokingly like the biological equivalent of killing every redhead in the room. It doesn't discriminate based on if they're good or bad, just uh, what's on their skin. And, uh, and that sounds crazy, but it is a considerable improvement over what's been done. Uh, on the other hand, we are killing cells based on what they're thinking, uh, based on the information inside. And what we've done basically is, is write little computer programs in DNA. Um, simple logic, it's Boolean logic. And uh, in fact, the, the first one simply said, if you're damaged, kill yourself. It's a simple if then statement. And the beauty of this approach is this is kind of how your body works anyway. I mean, it's, you think every, basically every cell in your body, every nucleated cell is the same genome for practical purposes, but uh, the, the genes being read in the control logic of uh, say a muscle cell are quite a bit different than a neuron or a skin cell. And so it's already used to like, looking at stimuli and making decisions. And so we write these little programs and they can be quite complicated. I mean, uh, synthetic biologists have made bacteria play tic-tac-toe like this quite, quite literally, but, uh, but these ones are simple. And uh, the simple idea though allows you to do something very powerful. And so this is an example of the targeting. And so we're targeting a, a gene here called P16, killing cells that have it turned on. And uh, on the left there, all the cells have it on. And you can see what happens when we activate this. The, the cells all die. They go into apoptosis. It looks a little bit like they're boiling on the video. So this is a time-lapse microscopy, by the way, just taking pictures of them in the microscope over time. On what's, uh, what's more significant, though, is this one on the right. Here you have a, a mixed population. Only 5% of those are P16 positive, the green ones. And when you activate it, those will die, but the other cells are unharmed. And this is very important because in, a, in cancer, we tolerate a lot of side effects. I mean, the standard of care is eating poison. But, uh, but in aging, you can't do that. Like, you want to get rid of one bad cell in an ocean of good cells. And the only way to do that is to basically not use the poison at all. And so using this genetic program allows us to very specifically target the cells we want and leave unharmed the ones we don't. So this, uh, um, so the idea here is you make the genetic program, you inject it, uh, just IV, it goes throughout the body, it hits all the cells, the good cells and the bad cells, but the program only activates in the bad cells. And this is, so it's basically taken targeting out of this realm of chemistry and it's brought it into the realm of information. We have a delivery system that's indiscriminate and a payload that's very specific. And, uh, and I don't have time to go into the details on it, but the way we deliver this is actually really interesting. And uh, it's a, something called a proteolipid vehicle, which is a kind of a nanoparticle technology. And uh, it uh, basically uses this little protein on the surface that was isolated from a, a virus that uh, infects the stomachs of alligators and birds. And uh, what's unique about it is it's super, super tiny. And uh, so it's effectively invisible to our immune system but it allows this thing to fuse with the, the membrane of any cell it touches. And so all it does is just drop its payload indiscriminately into any cell it runs into. And that's how we uh, have managed to basically make this distinction in targeting where the nanoparticle hits everything, the genetic payload, that, that logic dictates what lives and what dies. So here's just an example of what we've done with it um, in, in the field of aging specifically. This is a, we took a bunch of old mice. And so these are, mice are two years old. And if you think a, a lab mouse, this kind at least, uh, by two and a half years, half of them should die. And by three years, they should all be dead. So this is a, a fairly old mouse. You know, consider like maybe it's in a, its 70s and, and P16 
human years, if you will. Um, and we did this uh, for a couple of reasons. You know, one is the FDA is never going to let you give an anti-aging treatment to a child. So it, it's not really worth doing it from a translational perspective uh, right now. But also, uh, you know, rich people tend to be old. And uh, for practical reasons, it's way easier to excite people to support the work if you could show an improvement in something that was already old. And uh, so we treat them once a month, starting at two years of age, until they die. And this is like a, a, this little waterfall plot here showing the, the deaths. Every time the line goes down, a mouse died. And as you can see there, by about two and a half years, 50% of them are dead. And so it's, it's behaving exactly as one would expect. This is the control group. They're getting basically a saline injection. And by you know, just over three years, the last one kicks off. Well, when we administer a treatment that targets cancerous cells, we, we see something interesting and uh, with this kind of same logic, um, where you get a, an interesting kind of delta in mortality in this like upper age, so I call it like the 80s or so, where mortality is cut in half for a bit, but then they end up dying just like the others and by three years are effectively all gone. And when you target the zombie cells, the senescent cells, the P16, you get a benefit that's very similar to what I showed you in those initial mice, um, the, or in that study, where uh, you have an extension of life, and they call it kind of the squaring of the curve, where like they go on for longer than die abruptly. What was really fascinating though is what happened when we combined them. And I, I highlight this because it really shows the benefit of the technology. To build two separate molecules to target these pathways would be very difficult, maybe impossible to do it in a practical manner that wasn't toxic. But with the, the Boolean logic idea, it's quite simple. We, uh, we just built two logic gates. And, uh, and here you see that we don't lose a single mouse until half of the controls are dead. It's pretty remarkable. I mean, zero mortality <laughs> until, until halfway through this. And even of the ones that died, like a couple of them were sacrificed due to like getting uh, atopic dermatitis, like a bad rash. So they're, they're killed for animal welfare reasons. And uh, a couple for some more gruesome reasons that I won't get into, but uh, um, <laughs> I'm using for a different context. Um, but even by the end of the study, they weren't all dead. And so what, what you're looking at here is like something that meaningfully improves health span. And I mean, the, the goal really, in my mind is you die in a, a dirt bike accident at 150, you know, a young violent death at 150 years old is way better than a slow decline into morbidity. And so this is kind of what, what the potential of this kind of technology. Now we've also, uh, oh, so one more data point from that. Um, the bone density actually went up in, uh, in the males in this case. And I, I think uh, it may be doing it in the females too, but it, it wasn't significant. It wasn't really powered properly for it. And, uh, and so, the, the bone density basically is going up as the mice age. And it basically approaches, you know, like about half of the level it was when they were young. And so it's like taking, you know, your grandma and pushing her bone density back to, you know, the level it was when she was like 30 or 40. I mean, it's pretty, pretty wild. And uh, I mean, most of the diseases in uh, osteoporosis, slow bone loss, they don't regenerate like that. Okay, so uh, the first thing we're doing with this though is uh, we're taking it to the clinic for cancer. And, uh, and one of the reasons for that is the, the risk reward profile is, is optimal, um, but you can also see the results faster. I mean, waiting for mice to die of old age isn't so bad. Waiting for people to do it is an impractical trial. And uh, so I'll start though by showing just an illustration of how this targeting is so beneficial. So here on the, the left, you see a mouse that was injected IV, so it's tail vein with a, a gene that encodes firefly protein, luciferous. So it's the thing that makes the firefly light up. And if you do this to a mouse uh, or to, to any creature really, you can see it light up in an imager. And that's what you see, the whole body is basically lighting up because the nanoparticle is going everywhere. On the right though, we're using the same firefly uh, protein gene, but we've put the logic gate in place so that it only activates in cancerous cells. And in this mouse, a tumor has been implanted in its flank. You can see it there in the red dashed line. And so only the tumor lights up now. So this is still administered IV. It still went everywhere that you see here on the left, but it only activates the tumor. And this is the beauty of this kind of specificity. Like it, it's as elegant as, as life itself, basically. You can, you can make it as precise as, as you would like. And uh, so this, uh, oh, I'll show you this me uh, a little morbid, I suppose, but the, uh, 
people have tried to deliver uh, genetic programs like this for a while. And this is comparing it against probably the, the most common other clinical nanoparticle. And you can see uh, the, the mice up here are getting the same firefly protein infusion at different doses. But uh, what's interesting here is that if you use the kind of commonly available versions of it, um, but as the dose goes up, it's catastrophic. So these are their livers uh, down here, and it looks like someone took a blowtorch to it as the dose goes up. But uh, this actually kills them within tw uh, 24 hours. And that's, that's why, in fact, in the 24-hour slide, you're missing mice. And when this first happened, we thought it was a mistake, and we actually reran it a couple of times. Um, but it turns out that the, the kind of traditional tool for doing this is, has a maximum tolerable dose in, in the mouse of one microgram. Uh, the one millionth of a gram. And we're running ours at, at 600 here and not causing damage. So it's the, the idea of being able to manipulate information in, in life has been practically limited uh, due to the delivery technologies. And so I just kind of show this because it's a, it's a really kind of profound innovation in the, that you know, delivery has been Achilles heel of gene therapy ever since it, it started. And, uh, and we think that this can overcome it to a large extent. Okay, so this is an example of it just being used in a tumor. It is a, an old study, and uh, we uh, just injected it into the tumor. And what's uh, amazing about this is you can see, like, when we activate that, uh, that suicide gene that makes the cells die, the tumor drops off precipitously. Uh, within 48 hours, it's been reduced by 90% from a single treatment. And this is a mouse with no immune system and a human tumor implanted in it. And so, that, like I said, we don't inject them into tumors typically. This is just where we started with it. But this is a, a more uh, modern study, and I, you know, it's, a, it's a little technical for a, a common talk. But, uh, but what I think is interesting about it is we're comparing this treatment against uh, an immunotherapy called a checkpoint inhibitor. Um, and these are the things that you see them in the news a lot. Like, you know, like, like Jimmy Carter is one of the tools that brought him back. But uh, as a single agent, we can outperform it, and this is a, a colon uh, cancer model. But uh, when you combine it, it actually, it's completely curative. And what's amazing about this is that even if you wait a while, uh, the tumor doesn't come back, but then you implant a new tumor of the same kind in like a different part of the mouse, it will kill that tumor also. So it basically allows the immune system to gain the upper hand on it. And the, the checkpoint uh, inhibitor allows it to properly keep it under control at that point. Okay, so I'll do one more kind of bit of uh, application of this technology and then I'll, I'll move to questions. And uh, so we started using this delivery technology uh, for vaccinations and uh, COVID in particular. And so this is the thing, if, if you have the ability to manipulate uh, the code of life, basically, you can do really interesting things. And so Shortly after the, the genome sequence for uh, SARS-CoV-2 was published, we basically grabbed the, the DNA that encodes the spike of the virus and put it into this delivery system. And so basically you can inject this into a mouse or a, a person, <laughs> a creature of some sort, and, uh, and it will make your cells now start producing virus, or not the whole virus, though, just, just this little piece of it, the spike. And the, the beauty of that is your body can't really tell the difference. It, it looks and acts like a viral infection, but has no chance of actually being a virus because it's missing all the pieces it needs to assemble. And, uh, and so this allows you to basically direct uh, an immune response against a new target. And the beauty of this is like, it took a couple of weeks to put it together. Um, we've been playing around with a whole bunch of optimized versions of it, but uh, but you can develop these things rapidly. And since we use uh, DNA as the, the delivery, uh, the payload, as opposed to something like RNA, it's, it's far more scalable. Like, in fact, there was a, this kind of came out of a, a really early biohacker project I did during the last Ebola outbreak, where we were taking the, the DNA that encodes Ebola antibodies and putting them into monkeys. And, uh, and for, basically a couple hundred bucks worth of DNA, you could make a couple hundred thousand dollars worth of antibodies all inside the animal. No need to like purify it, stabilize it. It's being made by their own body and their own cells. And things like antibodies uh, or RNA are very unstable. They have to have cold supply chains. Uh, it's, it's difficult to manage them. Um, DNA is pretty tough though. I mean, we, we pull it out of mummies after all. And 
I mean, you, you should take better care of it, but a, a backpack full of DNA could wipe out a disease in a, in a continent, <laughs> you know, what you're doing with it. And so it's a, it's a remarkably uh, adaptable and, and powerful tool. Um, and also the, the delivery tool is interesting that you can administer an IV, which is most of what I've shown you, but you can also put it in the, in the muscle, which is in the middle, and you can even eat it. And uh, this is something we've been playing with uh, more experimentally, but uh, if you eat the delivery technology, it, it begins to actually modify the cells in your gastrointestinal tract. Okay, so I think I'll, I'll stop there and go to Q&A. Um, but uh, it's, this is a, the journey from plants and prayers into to information. And uh, I think, you know, as, as we go forward, we'll be able to apply this to not just diseases, but, uh, but aging itself. That, that's terrific. Thanks so much. And so I, I want to remind everyone, if you want to ask, ask a question, ask in the Q&A feature and not in the regular chat feature. That's how we're looking at it, actually. Um, it's just terrific stuff. Every time I hear this, I get excited about it again at this conference. So um, somebody's wondering if they're totally new to this field and they want to try to get up, uh, up to speed on it, especially this application of information theory intersecting with biotech. Do you have any uh, suggestions for reading for people that are you know, sort of just uh, new to this but want to get up to speed? Well, there's a lot of uh, kind of YouTube type videos on, on genetics and gene therapy. And that's probably the, the easiest things to understand. Um, there, I'm, I'm always impressed at what people put together and throw mm -hmm. up on there for free. I think if you want to get like to really understand how the tools work and see the data, it's mostly going through scientific literature. I found to be more productive. I mean, there, there are textbooks on it, but they're pretty much obsolete the day they're published and uh, and they're not necessarily easier to understand <laughs> in my mind right. than the journals anyway and so i i, I used to do some googling around for things like uh, gene therapy and yeah. uh, that's that's really kind of the i mean that's the term for this idea of manipulating information in life is uh is nomenclature i like to use for coming out of the world of computer science but yeah it's, it's not usually referred to that. right so it'd be gene therapy is the sort of subset uh, uh the subject on this because of course the way we speak of this in life and information as you said it's natural for us at discovery it's natural mm -hmm. for you as a computer scientist but the, the googling that's probably not going to pull up the, <laughs> yeah, thing, yeah, yeah. You know, <laughs> the information theory of life so explain the burden of your point uh, which might have been lost uh, in using DNA rather than RNA as, uh, as a delivery vehicle what's going on there well it's mostly just kind of one of those boring but important you know, practical details. I mean, there's a reason that your genome is written in DNA, not RNA. And so RNA is usually used as, as a messenger or as you know, kind of secondary control uh, apparatus. And it's very labile, so mm -hmm. it, it's not stable. It, it's not designed to be long-lived and it's not typically in the, and we've tried to, you know, from a, a biotechnology point of view, modify that molecule to make it uh, you know, more durable, but it really is just, uh, I mean, you look at it wrong and it falls apart, basically. Okay. And so the, the DNA is a, is a more useful tool. But uh, with the details of delivering it with those kind of nanoparticle technologies is that the DNA in the delivery technologies has been more toxic for a lot of, uh, hmm. a lot of the technologies. And it's not immediately clear why, but it, it's definitely observable. And, uh, and then you, of course, have the, the risk that DNA can stick around longer. But uh, if you have a delivery system where it's not toxic, mm -hmm. uh, you get all the benefits of the scalability and stability without, uh, without the downsides. Okay, cool. Um, so somebody's asking, what does CAR-T technology have to do with this? Not cool oh, enough. so CAR-T is uh, probably one of the, the first real popularized gene therapies out there. So technically, I guess a, a gene modified cell therapy. So in, with, uh, I mean, if you think back the very first uh, gene therapies were uh, directed at hematopoietic stem cells, like for things like boy in the bubble syndrome back a long time ago. Mm -hmm. But uh, the CAR-T kind of brought this into the forefront and they became like the first approved uh, gene therapies. And so they, uh, they're they predicated though on, on you manipulating the source code of your immune cells. So like you basically take an immune cell that would target some arbitrary thing and you force it to target something it didn't want to. And to do that, you have to insert a genetic payload. So it's, uh, and I, this is actually probably an interesting question for a lot of people. Can this technology, do you think, be used to develop T cells instead of B cells? Yeah, well, yeah. Um, I mean, the, 
one of the reasons we were focusing on on B cells in particular was that uh, we wanted to make something called a long-lived plasma cell, which is a subset of B cell. And so if you take, uh, say, the, the blood of an 80-year-old, you can find antibodies against smallpox in circulation still. And what's crazy is that those antibodies were being made by the same cells that were generated all those decades ago when they were first either exposed to the virus or the vaccine. And so these things have a, a half-life of something like 19 years. They, they live for a long time and they're super dedicated protein factories. So our, our goal is to, to build the app store to make things. B cells, you know, fundamentally they build things and T cells kill things. You know, it's a, it's a generalization for sure, but like, but T cells, that's generally speaking what they do, they're cytotoxic. And so the, the CAR T world has been focused on using T cells to kill cancer primarily. We wanted to basically be able to, to turn your body into a drug factory. That's why we focused on B cells. But you could use a very, it's a very similar approach for both. That's okay. So, where do you see this? Obviously, this seems quite disruptive, but where do you see if you had to sort of pre predict where this technology is going to go five or 10 or 20 years out? The specific gene therapy in general? Yeah, or, I'm thinking uh, you're uh, thinking uh, gene therapy in general. Well, I think it. Uh, it's moving from like ultra rare diseases to, to being more common. I mean, you think of the, uh, the first versions of, uh, I said that gene therapies were directed against, yeah, boy in the bowl syndrome, very rare mm -hmm. lethal childhood disease. And Imisoft's first treatment's going after a disease called MPS1, another rare genetic disease. But, uh, but CAR-T is you know, going after cancer, which is definitely not a rare disease at all, like, and starting with blood cancers, but, uh, but they're basically moving more and more into the mainstream. And, uh, and I think when you start, uh, I mean, the downside to things like CAR-T is they're, they're quite expensive to build and I mean, relatively dangerous at that. But uh, the, uh, the tools with the, the PLV or the nanoparticle-based technologies, like you can just inject them, like it, it's an infusion into your veins. And so the ability to manipulate all sorts of things that in the past, no one would have considered using a, a gene therapy effectively for a glorified cold like a coronavirus um mm -hmm. and uh i mean not to diminish its potential lethality but like this is something that like no one i think would have seriously considered using a gene therapy for a couple of years ago mm -hmm. for i mean it's a, right. if, i go we we darpa was messing with them i suppose but uh but in terms of mainstream and it's one interesting example of how the world can turn effectively overnight like we're now suddenly like you know uh, moderna the can't, was it can Sino uh, and the Oxford England one? These are effectively gene therapies for a cold virus. It's it's pretty wild, and so I think the field's going into a way where you're going to be able to use these tools for a much broader range of therapeutic applications. Well, okay, so I don't know if you know, Matt. I've got a book coming out on the on the coronavirus in a couple of months. So I'm I'm going to take the privilege here at the uh, end to ask you this question because I know you guys are working on this. There's a bunch of people working working on a so-called vaccine, right, for the coronavirus. And most people don't know that the FDA has never approved a, a vaccine for any coronavirus. And as you noted before we went on, it's because, well, unfortunately, they don't work, you know, <laughs> in the defense of the FDA. So, I mean, what are the prospects for this? Is the fact that we have not developed a vaccine in part a function of the fact that, well, you know, why bother? Why, or, or is there something sort of intrinsically difficult about this? Well, I think there's a... A little bit of both, but if you think of like SARS-1 and MERS, mm -hmm. both those had considerable mortality yeah. and considerable efforts launched to build vaccines against them. Um, part of it may be that people's attention spans are short and funding mm -hmm. dries up before they really work out all the kinks on it. Um, so the, I mean, it, it's difficult to know how how close people came to building like a, a functional MERS vaccine in a laboratory. Mm -hmm. Like, so they, they didn't push them all the way into yeah. a phase three trial, but like maybe they got ones that are pretty good on it. Okay. The, uh, the other aspect, though, I guess gets a little more technical in the, the role of humoral versus cytotoxic immunity in coronaviruses. Mm -hmm. And that if you think of like the common, you know, like flu vaccines, the seasonal flu ones, or you know, protein subunit vaccines that make a virus, blow it up, inject the rubble. And uh, these things can elicit antibodies, um, but not always uh, very effective T cell responses to it. Mm -hmm. um, the, the gene therapy type approaches with either DNA or yeah. RNA are quite good at eliciting a T cell response because it's displayed in, in MHC. Like, so the, the cell makes a virus, yeah. effectively, not, right. not a functional sure. one, but, uh, but it, the, the body sees it for what it is effectively. Okay. And in fact, we put a considerable effort into manipulating and modulating that aspect yeah. of it. So I, I, I'm optimistic that we will get, you know, things that can elicit 
greater protection against the coronaviruses. Mm -hmm. I think it's very much an open scientific debate whether or not post ex past exposure to other coronaviruses provide some level of T cell immunity. Right. Uh, although it doesn't appear to do humoral like antibody immunity, but uh, the uh, the T cell component, due to the way it presents the pieces of the virus, may overlap more. And uh, so that, that gives us some benefits. I'd say the biggest concern, though, is that the people they're least likely to work in are the elderly. Mm -hmm. And so you think even the seasonal vaccines for the flu, like you give my grandma's, it takes like five times the dose I do. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it, it takes so much to kick those old immune systems yeah. into gear that like, but you saw like the breakdown, this disease isn't much of a threat no. to young people. It's no. a threat to old people. And most of the clinical trials we've been looking at, like the early data, they're all in young people, like okay. our young healthy monkeys. Yeah. And, uh, and they're getting response rates that aren't that impressive in a okay. lot of them. And, uh, and so I, it makes me wonder if they will be able to elicit the, uh, a strong enough response in the mm -hmm. people who need them. The who most. actually need yeah. this for this and, particular coronavirus. And yeah, so, some are definitely better than others. I mean, we're, we're going to have like probably a dozen coronaviruses, it's a, a coronavirus yeah. vaccines, approved, and they are not created equal. Yeah. <laughs> so, some are considerably better than the others. Yeah, so. so it will be an interesting test. Matt, thanks so much. Thank you, guys. Good to see you in person.